Heidegger's Being in Time is one of the two most influential books of 20th century Western philosophy. Its method is explicitly that of Husserl's phenomenology, which we covered at an earlier lecture. But now Heidegger is going to apply that method to perhaps the biggest philosophical question of all, the question of ontology, that is, what is the meaning of being or existence itself? We will explore the argument of being in time from his notions of Dasein and Dasein's existential angst or anxiety, being in the world through being toward death, guilt, and finally temporality. All those are crucial terms in Heidegger's analysis, as we'll see. Martin Heidegger was born Roman Catholic in humble circumstances, but eventually attended the University of Freiburg, where he studied with Husserl. After a spiritual crisis and a conversion to Lutheranism, he completed his graduate work in philosophy, being influenced as well by Aristotle, Kierkegaard, and Brentano, an important late 19th century philosopher. He then became professor of philosophy at Marburg, and his early promise seemed to indicate that he would be the natural heir to Husserl as leader of Husserl's phenomenological movement. Now, the most fundamental distinction for Heidegger in being in time is the distinction between, in German, sein, which means being, and seiende, beings or things. Now let's pause for a moment and see what that means. What he means is simply this. I'm an entity, you're an entity, the lectern is an entity. Things, beings are entities. All these entities exist. What Heidegger is interested in is not their character as entities, but what it means for them to exist. In a sense, He's looking at existence as an activity. Being or existence is something these entities have and do. Heidegger is not interested in entities except insofar as he wants to go deeper and understand their mode of being or mode of existence, their sein in German. Now, to do this, Heidegger reformulates Husserl's methodological language in a quite remarkable way. If you think back to Husserl and remember his talk about the transcendental ego and his roughly Cartesian way of thinking about human experience, all that disappears in Heidegger. Talk of the transcendental ego, the natural attitude, even consciousness itself. I'm talking about the language of consciousness, the word consciousness, is thrown out by Heidegger. Phenomenology is now defined from the point of view of the phenomena. In other words, the way Heidegger uses Husserl's phenomenology to try to, just as Husserl wanted to, understand our primordial basic experience, uninfluenced by science or history or popular culture, just look at the things themselves as they emerge in experience, Heidegger now describes this project as literally letting what shows itself show itself in the way that it shows itself, which is simply another way of saying we're going to describe what other people call experience as the appearances that come before us, and we're going to have no other presuppositions about them. We're going to describe that basic level of experience or evidence. Heidegger says in the book Being in Time, that while he above all wants to understand the meaning of being per se, and in fact, that question, what's the meaning of being or sein per se, that's the dominant question of his entire philosophical career. But he says, you can't just jump into that question. We have to interrogate one kind of entity and ask about its mode of existence as a way into the question, what is the meaning of existence or being in general? Now, which entity should ye pick? Well, he thinks it's obvious. We ought to interrogate that entity which itself has an understanding of being as our mode of access to being. In other words, instead of asking ourselves, what's the mode of being of a rock or a tree 
or a dog or a planet. We're going to ask, what's that specific mode of being of that one entity we know that asks questions about being? In other words, human beings. Now, Heidegger was very clear that this is just the starting point of his inquiry. In other words, what he says he's going to do is, I'm really interested in the meaning of being. I'm using the analysis of human beings, of human existence, just as a ladder that I could later kick away. Nevertheless, that further part of his book was never completed or published. In other words, there was never a part of being in time or a being in time to where he moved from talking about Dasein's being to talking about the meaning of all being. We'll see in a later lecture the character of Heidegger's later philosophy. But nevertheless, it can be said that even many of the ideas of his later philosophy were here implicit in being in time. Now, the result of Heidegger's analysis, and you haven't seen it yet, but I'll tell you in advance, the result of his analysis was shattering. What Heidegger produced was a new kind of phenomenology of appearances as they present themselves in experience. But it's no longer Aristotelian or Cartesian or Kantian or Husserlian. He does not describe us as an ego, a mental substance, a mind inside a physical world. That way of describing things is banished. The human modes of existence or way of being, as he'll present it, are different from that of physical objects or other animals. Humans have a unique we aren't just a different thing. We have a different way of existing. The human existence that he's going to describe is the existence of a bodily active agent, open to, vulnerable to, literally defined in relation to the world, a being that is finite both in time, which means a being that dies, and is finite in its moral capacities meaning, in many ways, it is inadequate. In effect, Heidegger produced a wholly new picture of the human subject, an analysis devoid of Aristotelian substances, Cartesian minds, Kantian transcendental activity, and Husserl's transcendental ego. So this is genuinely new. Now, what we're going to try to do in this lecture is describe Heidegger's analysis of the human mode of being. Now to do this, before we proceed, let me just give you a brief picture of the whole. Essentially what Heidegger is going to do is start out with a basic characterization of what he thinks the human mode of being or existence is. He's then going to proceed to analyze this in several steps. He's going to get essentially halfway done, there's one big stage that he will complete. When he does that, which is his description of what he calls our average everyday way of being, the way human beings are every day, he comes to the end of that and says, wait, there's more. We now have to analyze not just how we are every day, but how we might be if we were authentic or true to ourselves. And that's the second half of being in time. We will be going through both. Now, one more part of that is, in each of these two stages of analysis, Dasein's existence is going to have a tripartite structure. There are going to be, in each case, three, so to speak, aspects of Dasein's being. And by the end of our analysis, we'll see that those three aspects have something to do with time, with the past, present, and future. Okay, now let's begin. Heidegger labels human being as Dasein. Now this word just means existence in German. But etymologically, and Heidegger loved etymologies, you can analyze the word into Dasein, their being or as it's usually translated, being there. So this means for Heidegger that Dasein, which is just his name for us, we are Dasein, 
Dasein is a being that's thrown into and open to the world. In other words, Dasein is not Descartes' cogito ergo sum, shut up inside a mind, where we have to ask, how does the mind know the world outside of it? We aren't like that. We are Dasein, that is, beings thrown into the world. The second step is, uh, Heidegger then says, this, the structure of the existence of Dasein, this is the most basic characterization he gives now, is what he calls being in the world. This means a couple of things. First, the world is actually a part of Dasein's existential structure. Unlike Aristotle's animal rationale, rational animal, or Descartes' mental substance, Dasein is in the world by definition. This he calls the worldhood which we constantly project as we move through our experience. Now the core phenomenon of being in the world, in addition to worldhood, is being in, or literally inness. Now this sounds rather strange, but what Heidegger likes to do is take the simplest words he can and find tremendous meaning in them. According to Heidegger, only Dasein is in the world in the sense of being open to it and by its presence disclosing it. Essentially that means having experiences. So let's stop for a minute. The lectern, the lectern for Heidegger is within the world. That's just his term for it. I am in the world. In other words, the way I am in the world is a funda fundamentally different mode of existence than the way the lectern is in the world. Why? Well, using a different language, you would say, because I experience the world. The lectern doesn't experience anything. Okay? Heidegger goes on to call Dasein, in Dasein's Innis, the Lichtung, which in German means both light and a clearing in the woods. Okay? Think of a clearing in the woods. There's a place where it's dark outside, and in the clearing, it's light, meaning things are revealed. You can see things. You can see the grass, you can see bushes, maybe you see rabbits and deer running around. I, Dasein, am like a clearing in the woods. Without human beings, there would be, so to speak, just the woods. But when I enter a room or any environment, I bring with me this capacity to experience, which means things get revealed around me. Dasein does that to things. In effect, Heidegger is reinterpreting the word consciousness and the word experience through this notion of the clearing where things are revealed. Okay. Now, Dasein finds in being in the world, as I said before, a tripartite structure. So first we're going to look at Dasein's average everyday being in the world and see how it's characterized in three different ways by this tripartite structure. Now the first part of the structure is called existentiality. Existentiality for Heidegger is the projection of the possibilities of disclosing things and that simply means for him understanding. Dasein understands things. For Heidegger it makes no sense to ask the philosophical question does Dasein understand anything? Maybe we're wrong about everything. For Heidegger this is just absurd. Human beings always understand things. That's how we experience. We may also misunderstand some things. We carry around with us and project around us a, a, a network of meanings in which the objects of experience are revealed and that shows how they're related. Dasein, as it lives, is constantly projecting out from itself contexts of possibilities in which experience is revealed to it. Note here, let's pause for a second to note, understanding is for Heidegger constantly connected with the idea of possibility. When I understand what a chair is, it's not because 
when I walk into a room and I see an object with, you know, a brown seat and uh, metal legs, etc., that I then, from sense data, then make an inference that it's a chair and, oh, what can I do with chairs? Chairs, by definition, I can sit on. When I see or experience the chair, because I am already familiar with it, I understand the chair in terms of what can be done with it. In other words, its possibilities of use. And possibilities have to do with the future. In other words, understanding is oriented toward the context of possibilities pointing towards possible actions and possible experiences that can be had with an object in the future. Now, the second existential characteristic of, or part of the structure of Dasein's existence is facticity, or the fact that we are thrown into the world open and vulnerable to it. Now, that's a rather abstract term, but what Heidegger gets out of this is that Dasein is always already characterized by a state of mind or mood. That is to say, my facticity means that I am just in some state or another, some contingent state at every moment. I am carrying the weight of the just past. You see, mood or state of mind has something to do with the past. Something that's happened has put me in a mood, and I carry that mood into my next moment of experience. Now, the third crucial feature of Dasein's everyday existence is what he calls falling. Falling is the inauthentic identification of Dasein with things within the world. Dasein, for reasons that will become clear, typically understands itself through present objects and subjects, that is, other people in the world. In falling, we submerge into ourselves into what Heidegger called Das Mann. Now, in German, this Das Mann, Heidegger was always taking everyday German terms and twisting them into a new usage. Mann in German just means one, as if we were to say in English, uh, one shouldn't do that. Das Mann is, to say Das Mann is to speak of the one with a capital O. It's very similar to what we say in English when we say, well, you know what they say. And that's why the translators of Heidegger have rendered Das Mann as the they self. In other words, in our average everyday understanding or misunderstanding of being, I identify with both the present entities that surround me in the day, especially the ones I'm after, the objects of desire, money, for example, so on the one hand, present objects, and on the other hand, I am overwhelmed by and identify myself with whatever the public culture thinks, whatever they think, whatever the newspapers say. There is here in Heidegger a very basic critique of modern mass culture. Most of us live according to the they rather than according to our own authentic phenomena of existence. Indeed, Dasein flees into the they self and absorption in things or entities. Why? Because, and now we're going to get Heideggerian existentialism, because Dasein wants to avoid angst or anxiety. Anxiety is not a bad thing for Heidegger. Anxiety is the proper response to the finite, open-ended nature of human existence. It's only when we begin to feel anxiety, and here we don't have to try to define anxiety too carefully except to say, it's not the fear of a specific event, but an open-ended sense of fear or dread about existing as a human being. That fear is a good for Heidegger because it's only when we feel it that we're beginning to recognize the truth about human existence. Now the truth of anxiety and what lies behind it is Sorge in German or care. 
And this now brings us to the end of the first half of the book, Being in Time. I said there were two stages in the analysis of Dasein. We're now at the end of the first one. What Heidegger claims is that the fundamental truth about everyday human being is that we are care. Dasein existentially cares. It cannot not care. Its being is an issue for itself. To care is to be anxious. So the preliminary analysis of the average everyday existence of Dasein is that Dasein is care. And Heidegger then defines care. He gives it again a tripartite structure to reflect the tripartite structure of the analysis that we mentioned earlier. Namely, care for Dasein, in care, Dasein is, and I quote, ahead of itself, in always being already in the world as being alongside entities. You'll notice that those three modes, ahead of itself links to understanding and possibility, hence the future. Always being already in the world links to the past and mood, state of mind, facticity. And being alongside entities connects with the present, which is where the they and the entities surrounding me are. So this is the mode of Dasein's existence. The structure of Dasein's existence is tracking those three components, understanding or existentiality, mood and facticity, and finally falling into identification with entities in the they self and the present. Now, such is everyday Dasein, and indeed, for Heidegger, Everyday Dasein is the most fundamental. This is how we are most of the time in these three modes, combining these three modes. And we are typically as fallen inauthentic. We're caring most about buying objects, about whatever is on the news, about whatever they around us say, failing to recognize the truth of our existence. So Heidegger realizes at the end of part one of Being in Time, he has to go further to understand what Dasein would be if it completed itself. In other words, if it were authentic. Authentic in the sense of being truly its own. Okay? So for authentic Dasein, understanding or being ahead of itself and facticity or always already being in the world are reconceived in the second half of being in time. In two ways. And there's two crucial aspects to this authentic Dasein. Let's go back to the notion of the ahead of itself projective understanding, understanding the possibilities of the future. As ahead of itself and projecting its understanding into the future, if we take that understanding of my future as far as it could go, where does it lead? My death. Dasein is the only being that knows it's going to die. Dasein's potentiality for being a whole can only mean what Heidegger calls being toward death. To live toward death doesn't mean go out and try to die or try to hasten the time or you know, minimize the time between now and death. To live toward death is what's required for an authentic Dasein, the recognition that my being is always moving towards its finite end. And for Heidegger, who is an atheist at this point, and who does not believe in any sense in a survival of any part of Dasein beyond the grave, my death is my complete ending. So the first part of authentic Dasein is living with its being toward death. Now, as always already having been in the world, remember that's the past related, mood related uh, component of the tripartite structure, Dasein has the potentiality of being guilty. Now, what does that mean? Guilt for Heidegger, the German is Schuld, but guilt for Heidegger means recognizing what I am not. Dasein recognizes, if it's authentic, all that it is not, has not ever been, and will not ever be. 
This is an awareness of a kind of existential guilt in Heidegger. In Heidegger, guilt is, well, if you will, a good thing. But it means not just guilt in the narrow sense of did I lie to my wife or did I yell at my children, what particular acts have I done, although that's part of it. It's an awareness of my finitude, just like awareness of my oncoming death is an awareness of my finitude in time. Awareness of guilt is an awareness of how I am literally, in his German, that I am full of knots, or I, not N-O-T-S. I am filled with absences and lacks what I haven't been and what I won't be. When Dasein incorporates these two recognitions into itself, when it, to use Heidegger's language, it begins to listen to its existence, meaning its actual mode of being. It listens to its existence calling it. It ceases to fall into the they of everydayness and instead achieves what Heidegger calls anticipatory resoluteness. Anticipation has to do with death. Resoluteness has to do with guilt in the past. Anticipatory resoluteness is a resolute acceptance of, it, of my guilt in the anticipation of my death. Dasein now is hearing the call of its own authentic existence. It is no longer fallen. Okay. Now it's clear at this point that the structure of being underlies Dasein's whole existential series of structures. What most underlies it is temporality. Now Heidegger I've told you this from the beginning, in the actual book being in time, it's only toward the end that we suddenly realize, aha, what's been unifying the whole analysis of being in time from beginning through uh, anticip anticipatory resoluteness is in fact the three modes of time, past, present, and future. Now, Heidegger tells us, Dasein's existential structure, its deepest meaning the deepest meaning of what my mode of existence is, is as he says, and I quote, letting itself come toward itself in having been as making entities present. Or, to put it more simply, time is one's authentic self coming towards oneself as already always having been there. That is, one recognizes it's always been there in the act of making entities present or recognizing the presence of entities. So in conclusion, Dasein's existence is based in a time structure. Uh, now to summarize, we have essentially probed the archaeology of the structure of the existence of human being from, and let's go through some of the stages, from the definition of, uh, or I should simply say the naming of human being as Dasein, to the basic fundamental characterization of Dasein's mode of being as being in the world, to the two structures of world and, on the other hand, being in or disclosiveness or the clearing, those two structures, then the tripartite structure of understanding state of mind and the they, anxiety about these conditions was the clue to then reveal care as the fundamental structure of everyday Dasein, but then we saw being towards death and being guilty as revealing to us the need for anticipatory resoluteness, all of which shows us that what it means to be human above all is to be temporal, to be a finite entity in time. Now this implies the possibility that time is the context in which being itself must be interpreted. Remember, we went all th through all this in order to interpret Dasein, but then so we could interpret the meaning of being. Does this mean time is the meaning of being? Heidegger never fulfilled this project, although he came close to this in a later essay called On Time and Being. Now let's step back for a moment and look at what we've gotten from Heidegger. Heidegger's impact was enormous. A generation of young German and French students were taken not so much by the search for the meaning of being. In other words, the big long-term ontological project 
was not so much what moved most readers of Being in Time, but rather Heidegger's existentialism. And this is the beginning of 20th century existentialism in Heidegger's Being in Time. For Heidegger gives us a non-scientific account of human being, influenced by his unique readings of the Greeks, of Nietzsche, and of Kierkegaard. As with Wittgenstein, students were overwhelmed by the power of, the, and of Heidegger's concentration and depth of thought in his classes. But in Heidegger's case, finitude, death, and resolute action were the lessons to be learned. And this way of understanding human existence in terms of finitude without God, without an unending future, but simply recognizing one's limited time as a kind of template or a kind of scaffolding on which one must hang one's own resolute acts, realizing at all times one's limitations and one's guilt. That conception became the core of 20th century existentialism, and it all comes from Heidegger's being in time.